This is a new start for Lotus from instead of making a handful of hand-built cars through the years to now becoming a proper challenge, a proper rival to the likes of Porsche, Lamborghini, Aston Martin and so on. So, what's the Elettra like to drive here on Malaysian roads? Does it feel anything like a true Lotus to drive? And most importantly, should you buy one over other super hyper SUVs? Here's my full review. The Lotus Elettra feels very much like when Porsche first unveiled its Cayenne SUV all those years ago. Practically the entire industry rolled their eyes at it. But that model quickly shaped Porsche into what we know it as today. A highly successful, super profitable, high-end car maker. That is the target for Lotus. With the Elettra and of course the Amea that is to follow, Lotus aims to shift from a car maker that has built just around 100,000 cars throughout its 75 year existence into a car maker that is making 100,000 cars every single year. That is a super ambitious target considering even at its absolute peak, Lotus only made about 5,000 units in a single year. To achieve that, Lotus needs a lot of money pumped into it and now that it's owned by Geely, it certainly has that. Geely has successfully transformed or rejuvenated Volvo from just a couple of years ago and now it aims to do the exact same thing to this British brand. By the way, while Geely owns the majority 51% of Lotus, the other 49% is still owned by a Malaysian company called Etika Automotive. So while Lotus is no longer owned by DRB or Proton, it is still technically partly owned by a Malaysian company. Now let's talk about the price. The Lotus Elettra was first launched in Malaysia last year with prices starting from just under 600,000 ringgit. That certainly caught a lot of attention because for the same price as a Porsche Cayenne, you can get this instead, which is clearly a much bigger, much more substantial SUV. But unfortunately, things have changed a little bit for 2024. The base Elettra has been completely dropped for the Malaysian market, at least for now. So it now starts with the Elettra S with prices starting from 698,000 ringgit. Prices have gone up across the board because clearly Ringgit isn't doing all that well, especially against British Pound. One pound is now six Ringgit, if you're not aware. Over in the UK, the Elettra S is priced at about £110,000, which translates to about Ringgit. So this here in Malaysia is very close to that. I think that's all right. The car that you see here, however, is an Elettra S with quite a lot of cost options added onto it. So what you see here is 850,000 instead. But you know what? I still think that is a relative bargain in this market. By right, this goes against cars like the Lamborghini Urus and the Aston Martin DBX. Each one of those will cost you well over 2 million ringgit. Then there is the BMW XM as well, and even that is going to cost you 1.5 million in today's market. Now, of course, you can go ahead and register those cars in Langkawi in a trick that is technically not illegal. But even then, you'll still be paying more than the full price of this car and only get to drive it over a few months out of a year. With the Elettra, you get to enjoy it all year long. Moving away from prices, Lotus clearly needed its cars to look absolutely wild to even closely rival any of its competitors. Now, in terms of design, I'd say the Elettra is absolutely insane. Lotus calls this a porous design. You've got big holes and vents all over the car, each one of them with real aerodynamic properties, somewhat like the Ford GT. Even its active grille shutters, which is a very common thing among most EVs, is made extra special on this Elettra. Overall, I would say this looks far more functional with a lot more road presence compared to its other sporty SUVs with all their fake vents. 
Around the side, the Electra is also almost absurdly long at 5.1 meters, and the wheelbase is even over 3 meters. It is also excessively wide at over 2.2 meters, so this is a massive hunking machine out on the roads. The wheels are 21 inches here on the Electra S, and you can even pick and choose from different colors and finishes, and even the brake calipers can be changed to different colors as well, up to your liking. There is also a larger 23 inch option for an extra 21,000 ringgit. Speaking of options, this blossom grey colour, which I think is absolutely stunning, is an extra 11,000 as well. And the digital mirrors that you see here are an extra 12,000 ringgit. Moving further back, the Electra also has pop out door handles similar to Range Rovers, and this being a Lotus, all the doors also have frameless windows. Moving on to the back, you've got even more insane aero details. We've got this huge hole down here that sucks air out from the rear wheel arches. And you've got more air channels up here as well. At the top, we've got two winglets on each side acting as a top spoiler because there is a set of LiDARs at the middle as well. The lights, however, I will have to admit it does look a little bit generic, especially in the sea of Chinese electric SUVs lately. But it does light up with quite a nice animation with a few colours as well. That does look pretty cool. At the top over here, you've got an active rear spoiler that pops up at speed. And this having an exterior carbon pack, it also adds on this carbon fibre lip spoiler just down here. That includes the full rear diffuser and the front lip as well. But if you're feeling a little bit extra, you can also go for the full extended carbon package that practically turns all the black bits around the bottom of the car, the sides, the front as well in full carbon fibre, but that's going to cost you an extra 55000 Moving on inside, the Lotus Elettra looks absolutely wild, all in a good way as well. From the design to the perceived quality, everything here is absolutely top-notch. Perhaps one of the best I've ever seen in the entire industry. All the major touch points are either soft leather, Alcantara or high quality alloy. Even all the intricate buttons on the steering wheel feel cold to the touch and even the pedals behind the steering wheel, everything looks and feels super posh and expensive. Pretty much the entire top half of the cabin is lined in Alcantara and the bottom half is fully covered in leather. Even the bottom door bins down here, believe it or not, it's also lined in leather. That's insane. And then you've also got the subtle Lotus design touches such as the so-called weight saving holes within the steering stocks back here. And then you've also got similar holes on the wiper arms themselves. Clearly though, these are more for show sure than anything else because, you know, shaving off a couple of milligrams here and there on a two and a half ton car, it's probably as effective as, you know, shaving off a couple of hairs on an elephant. And then we come to the functional bits. The front half of the cabin has no less than five screens. You've got two for the digital side mirrors, two in front of each passenger, and one massive one right down the middle. Let's talk about the side digital mirrors here first. These are perhaps the coolest screens because they are the most abnormal screens that you don't find on most other cars. But tell you what, I hate I absolutely detest these things. Just give me the standard mirrors, save your 12,000 ringgit and be done with it. The camera feed is clear and sharp enough, but it's just the position of the screen is just placed well below my usual field of view. Looking forward to drive, every time I look to the side for the side mirror, I then have to readjust my eye line further down to look at the mirrors. And even then, I don't think the lens is actually wide enough to give you a proper sense of surrounding around the car. But the worst thing about this camera system is that it doesn't give me quite enough of a sense of depth. Whether I've driven past the car enough to merge or not, everything becomes a bit of a guessing game when you're driving around near enough a million ringgit car that can get quite dangerous. 
Moving on to the other screens, the one on the left in front of the front passenger is a bit useless to be honest. Other than showing the time of day and perhaps the music track, it doesn't really do anything else. The one on the right in front of the driver is a very minimalist instrument cluster. It just shows you all the basic information but that's more than enough because you also get a big head up display on top for all the other information that you may need. The big center screen over here is where all the action is at. First thing you'll see is that this 3D representation of the entire car which is powered by the Unreal Engine and it looks superb. This follows everything that is actually happening to the car. Right now we've got the boot open, we've got the side doors open and everything is shown on this car as well. Even if I were to wind down the windows, you can see the same thing happening on the 3D model right there. I think that is pretty cool. However, I don't get why this 3D model over here cannot follow the exact color and wheel combination of your actual car. Right now, it just shows a generic grey and a generic wheel on the car. It doesn't match your actual car. I think that is quite disappointing. Beyond that, the screen has a lot of additional functions, perhaps too much, including even adjusting your aircon vents. As you can see, there's no way to adjust the aircon vents down here or even the sides there. To do that, you have to press this button over here and then drag on the screen to adjust where the vents would blow. Can you imagine doing this when you drive? That's absolutely diabolical. Other than that though, the screen does give you quite a lot of customization options from all the ambient lighting colors and all that. So it does give you plenty of toys to play with, including an actual game, which is here. This to me is such a silly game that you can play. It doesn't fit the character of the car at all. I don't understand why you even have this feature in a Lotus Elettra. I think it's absolutely silly. I'm sure you can install more games later on, but as it is right now, why? Speaking of things that will come very soon, this includes Apple CarPlay and Android Auto. This car doesn't have it right now, but it will get it in an OTA update very, very soon, we've been told. Moving on from the screen, the Elettra S has an absolutely top of the range KEF reference sound system with over 2,200 watts and 23 speakers positioned all around the cabin and it sounds absolutely beautiful. Beyond the insane looks on the outside and even the interior quality, it is the sound quality that will impress your friends the most in this Elettra. Before we move on to the rear seats, the front seats are actually fairly comfortable by Lotus Sport Seat standards. However, I do find myself sometimes wishing for a bigger, comfier, softer seat that would perhaps fit the character of the Elettra more than these buckets. In the back here, as you can see, I've got plenty of legroom and headroom is also good. Even NBA players, I think, can fit in the back here quite well. However, fitting and sitting comfortably are two different things. And even for my frame, 167cm tall, sitting up straight, I've got my knees up in the air and I've got no thigh support either. It's not especially comfortable back here. This is the usual EV thing because it runs a typical skateboard EV platform with a battery under the floor that has pushed the floor up. So you get this rather awkward seating position. That's pretty much par for the course for most EVs out there. This car having this much legroom, however, does give you the option to just slide your feet forward. And I think it's fairly comfortable even for longer journeys. However, if the front seat is pushed all the way down, then you won't be able to fit your feet under the seat anymore. So yeah, then you will be in a less comfortable position through your journeys. As for the seats themselves, they are fairly flat, surprisingly not very supportive, but you do get an electrically adjustable recline angle like so. For the Elastra, there is an executive 4 seat option for 30,000 ringgit. That adds on a big center console in the middle and two individual seats on the side. I think that would be far more comfortable and the seats would be far more adjustable as well. That would fit the Elastra way more than what it is right now. Another important thing is that that will also move the screen that you see down there way out of reach to somewhere around this side. That screen over there is similar to 
what you'd find in a Tesla Model 3 but it does not play any videos. Here, it can just adjust your air conditioning settings, your aircon vent, yes, via touchscreen as well, as well as your music settings. One last thing, you can also adjust your sunroof through that screen. This car here is fitted with a 12,000 ringgit smart sunroof option and this can adjust automatically between being fully opaque and being semi-clear. But I'm not quite a big fan of this feature because even in this clearest position, the glass is a little bit cloudy, it's not quite clear enough. I would be much happier with the 8,000 ringgit standard sunroof in this car, I think. But beyond that, the build quality back here is still stunningly good. You've got more Alcantara back here. Even the grab handles are fully lined in leather. More leather down here. Proper touch points everywhere. I think it's absolutely top notch. Even at the front here, you've got more alloy finishing with the ACBC embossed logo. If you're wondering what that means, that is Anthony Colin Bruce Chapman, the founder of Lotus Cars. One last thing to open the doors, you'll find no handle back here. All you have to do is press this button, just like in a Tesla. And as usual, there is also a backup manual release lever down here, just in case the power cuts out. One last thing before we go for a drive, let's talk about the boot space. It is properly massive at 688 litres. It's wide, it's deep and it's fairly tall as well. However, this parcel shelf isn't very useful. It is very nicely finished in leather, but once removed, there's no place to put it because it doesn't fit under the floor of the boot. Open up the small flap over here, you've got a small space to fit your tyre repair kit and your charging cables but nothing much beyond that. There is also a pretty decent front trunk on this car but nothing quite as useful as on a Tesla. What is properly functional however is that with this car's full air suspension setup, if you've got very big and heavy items to carry into the boot, you can just press a button over here. As you can see over here, it really compresses the rear suspension of the car all the way down as if it's been completely slammed. So now the boot lip is much, much lower than before. So now let's go for a drive, shall we? So finally, we're on the move in the Lotus Elettra S. Let's talk about all the numbers first. This has a dual motor setup and this is a symmetrical setup. Both the front and rear have got the exact same outputs. So combined, the Elettra S offers 605 horsepower and 710 newton meters of torque. So it goes from zero to 100 in four and a half seconds only. But you know what? This doesn't quite feel like one of the faster electric cars out there, even though its numbers, its figures would suggest that it is. It doesn't quite feel like it. A higher end Tesla or even a Porsche Taycan, those feel far more aggressive, far more immediate when it comes to the power response. Here, the power delivery it is certainly quick, but it doesn't feel alarmingly so. It's 0 to 100 time of four and a half seconds is accurate. I've already timed it at about 4.6 seconds, close enough to 4.5. But like I said, in terms of its immediate torque delivery, it doesn't feel quite as aggressive as even a Volvo XC40. This apparently was tuned into the electric motors themselves, so even if you are very heavy footed, if you plant your foot down mid corner, it would not unsettle this big heavy SUV. Perhaps that's not quite a bad thing. If however you really insist on a neck braking acceleration, you will have to go with the Elettra R. That adds on a much more powerful electric motor at the back. The rear itself will have 600 horsepower. So combined, you'll get 905 horsepower and almost a thousand newton meters of torque. That can go from 0 to 100 in under 3 seconds. There are also other differences too. While this Elettra S together with the base Elettra runs a single transmission, if you want to call it that. The Elettra R runs a two-speed transmission, similar to what you'd find in a Porsche Taycan. 
that will give it additional performance at higher speeds but having driven the S I really don't think you need it this is more than enough performance that anyone would need or even want anything more and that would just be excessive really even as it is the Electra S may not have quite a headlining acceleration figure 0 to 100 in just 4.5 seconds it doesn't really sound like all that fast nowadays especially with big heavy SUVs doing 3 under 4 seconds nowadays but I still think it feels quicker than equivalent BMW XM a Lamborghini Urus and even the Aston Martin DBX of course you don't get all the big drama in terms of the audio in terms of the engine sound exhaust track and so on but purely in terms of speed this is right up there I think even the top speed of Lotus Elytra is relatively high compared to other high performance EVs most other EVs usually top out at about 200 perhaps just a little bit more than that but this being a Lotus it goes all the way up to 258 kilometers per hour the Elytra R goes slightly faster than that still Still on performance, like I said, the Electra S is more than powerful enough for most people and the fact that it isn't quite as aggressive as most other electric cars are, it means it is quite a bit more comfortable for the driver and especially its passengers. With most other performance EVs, every time you plant your foot down, if you have passengers, they will most likely scream in fear. But in the Electra R, that big surprise is a little bit more damped, so I think that's the better for for it. You also have a few driving modes to choose from which you can select via these pedals behind the steering wheel. These don't work like in a regular car of course because it's actually two separate buttons, one up and one down. However, to change from one mode to the next, you actually have to press the button twice. The first time you press it, it just calls up all the options and then you're going to press it again to move from say Tour to Sport it's not quite as intuitive or as easy to use as the boost pedal in certain BMW i electric vehicles. By the way, when you change the driving modes, the bigger, more apparent differences are in the suspension settings. In Tour or the so-called comfort mode, it is fairly supple. It is in the softest possible settings. But as soon as you go into sport, everything lowers down, it hunkers down, and it is quite a bit more stiff. But I'll talk about the driving comfort later on in this video. The left pedals control the brake regen settings. Here you can choose between four or five different regen settings all the way from off as in full coasting all the way up to level four. Even at the highest setting, it's not quite full single pedal driving. Even if I lift off from the throttle completely, it doesn't brake anywhere near as hard as most other EVs with a single pedal mode. But having said that, the actual brake pedal on the Electra is the absolute best I've ever tested on any EV yet. It feels very natural, there's plenty of actual feel in the pedal and the feedback is as if I'm driving a standard low slung high performance car. It is that good, the best I've ever tried on any EV bar none. But now let's talk about energy consumption and then range. I've driven this car for about 400 kilometers as I normally do for these reviews and I've averaged about 22 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers on this car against its maximum battery size of 112 kilowatt hours with a usable part of 109 kilowatt hours that translates to just about 500 kilometers of real world range with my driving style. Lotus on the other hand claims a full 600 kilometer range on the WLTP cycle so yeah the difference is actually quite large an energy consumption of 22 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers is certainly the highest I've seen in an EV yet but considering the size and weight of this thing I don't think it's unnecessarily excessively high either I mean say a standard EV runs about 15 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers this is 22 so that's just about 50% higher but if you are to do the same comparison on regular cars an average car may do as low as say 8 liters per 100 kilometers whereas a performance car may do up to 20 that's double or even triple a standard car's fuel consumption so over here 
here is only 50% more, I think it scales up much more gradually with EVs. Now let's talk about charging where the Electra is pretty impressive. For DC fast charging, this has a maximum rate of up to 350 kilowatts with its 800 volt architecture, again matching the Porsche Taycan. At the fastest rate, this can go from 10 to 80% SOC in just 20 minutes. That's pretty quick right there. For AC, it's also pretty fast with a 22 kilowatt AC onboard charger. This means that you can charge this car from zero to absolute full at home in just about five hours. This is definitely quicker than most other EVs with just seven or 11 kilowatt AC charger. Now let's talk about the thing that makes or breaks a true Lotus. This being a big, tall, heavy SUV. This is perhaps the least Lotus-like vehicle you can ever think of. But times have changed and if you're chasing sales numbers, this is the kind of car that Lotus has to make right now. So let's talk about handling first. Being as tall as it is, being as heavy as it is, over two and a half tons, it actually is quite remarkable how agile this SUV is, especially if you go into sport mode, it lowers down a little bit and everything gets stiffened up. It is, yeah, it's mind-blowing how quickly you can change directions, you can blast through sweeping corners in this car and how flatly it would do so. This has the optional Lotus handling package which includes active anti-roll bars and even four-wheel steering. This adds on about 30,000 ringgit to your price list but it's well worth it if you ever want to drive this Lotus Elettra like a proper Lotus. I think it's superb. Active anti-roll bars, of course, is similar to what, say, McLaren have been using for quite a while now, but on a big SUV like this, it makes a massive difference. It means that you can throw it quickly into a corner without even a hint of body roll, even though this is such a big and tall car, and it's fairly soft on the straights as well, soaking up all the bumps, but in corners, it actually feels like a low-slung sports car. Its duality in terms of its driving identities is just excellent. It's beyond reproach. Nothing else comes even close to an SUV that handles as well as this. Before this, my absolute benchmark for an agile SUV has been the BMW XM, which to me handled way better than even a Lamborghini Urus. This, however, takes it to the next level still. If you only want one single car to carry your family around, have fun up and down Genting, as well as around Sepang, this is the very car to do so. The one thing that lets the whole package down very slightly is the steering feel. This, of course, is an electric power steering. This is Lotus's very first EPS and it's one of the better ones out there. But if you measure it against a proper Lotus steering, this falls well short. It doesn't quite give you all that much feedback through the corners, although it is extremely direct and pretty quick. Plus, with the rear wheel steering system, you will be surprised just how agile a big SUV can be, like in this one. As it is, the performance is top-notch, perhaps not quite you know, on-off switch like in a Tesla, but more than fast enough to handle other ice-powered vehicles. The brakes are also beyond excellence, as good as brakes can be on any car. Handling is really good, it's just the steering wheel a tiny bit less than what you would hope for when it comes to a performance vehicle. But then again, the Electra isn't an out-and-out -out performance sports car, is it? It is a big SUV, a luxurious one at that. And for that, it needs to handle straight roads even better than corners. And with its full air suspension system, with its active anti-roll bar as well, on the straights, it is by far and away the most comfortable, big, sporty SUV there is. I think the XM gets fairly close, but this is way more comfortable than say an Aston Martin DBX and especially Lamborghini Urus. Out on the highways, out on straight roads, this can almost pass off as a luxury vehicle like a Range Rover 
and so on. The way it wafts about on highways, the way it floats across the roads, it is nearly Mercedes-Benz S-Class levels. For a car with this level of handling performance and this much speed to be nearly as comfortable as an S-Class, that is amazing. However, as with most things, it's not quite perfect and this certainly isn't. While it may be very comfortable out on the open roads, as soon as you hit much lower speeds and sharper bumps, the suspension can stumble on itself as well. So overall, the Elettra has a fantastic primary ride, but its secondary ride may need a bit of work. I guess you really can't help it because this really is such a heavy son of a gun. You've got big massive 22 inch wheels, rubber band tires running fairly high pressures as well. So it really can't deal with sharper smaller bumps but for a car as expensive as this it does give a bit of a jarring feeling every time the car skips over a bump it feels like it's not handling it as well as it should plus with bigger bumps at lower speed as well you can almost hear the front suspension working going up and down not quite as refined as a luxury high-end vehicle should be I think Next, let's talk about refinement. So far, it is pretty good, but it's not quite the best in the business, I would say. Driving around at 80, 90, even 100 kilometers per hour on you know, very rough Putrajaya roads, you hear pretty much no wind noise coming into the cabin, but plenty of road noise coming in. This car rides on pretty decent Pirelli electric tires and you can hear just so much tire roar going into the cabin. As soon as you hit a rougher patch of roads, it can get quite deafening. Other EVs like a BMW iX, a Mercedes-Benz EQS are far quieter still. But of course, both those cars focus way more on comfort rather than this one which also has to handle as well as a Lotus. So I guess there are certain sacrifices that has had to be made. Hilariously, there is a weird no-cost option that you can spec with your Lotus Elettra. You can choose a much smaller 20-inch wheels with much thicker tyres and that will give you far longer range, much more comfortable ride and I'm sure a much quieter cabin as well. But at the expense of looks on the outside, I don't think anyone in the right mind would go for an Elettra with 20-inch wheels. Normally, you'd go bigger, not smaller. Last but not least, let's talk about the Active Safety Systems or ADAS, Active Driver Assist Systems. This has plenty of attention-grabbing features, including cameras all around the car. I mean, just one side mirror alone has got three cameras around it. That's way more than anything I've seen yet. At the top, this car even has LiDARs and you've got small little things that pop out from the side at the front as well. There's another big LiDAR at the back pointing back. But at this very moment in 2024, none of those things actually work. The LiDARs are just dummies at this moment. They are just there in hope that in a few years, someone can come up with a software that is complete that is powerful enough to actually drive the car using all these LiDAR information. Right now, they're just you know dummies, they're placeholders. Hopefully, in a couple of years, all those things would actually be put in use, but right now, yeah, they are not. So as it is, even if you put on the adaptive cruise control features on this car, which there are plenty, you'll only be using the front set of cameras at the top and a radar at the front, nothing more. It does not use information given from the LiDAR at all. And as it is, its semi-autonomous driving features are just okay, nowhere near as complete as say a Tesla, BMW or even Mercedes would offer. As it is, it still feels a little bit rough the way it detects cars coming in, detects cars coming out, the way it reacts to them, it can be a little bit jarring, it can be a little bit rough. Uh, yeah, it's just not quite as smooth an experience as one of the better ADA systems out there. It's a pity, but yeah, that's just how it is. But then again, I don't think you would buy a Lotus to let the car drive you, you'd buy it to drive it yourself. I mean, it is the brand's tagline for the driver. So yeah, I don't think the inferior Adas counts too much against the Lotus Elettra as it is. So that's my full review of the Lotus Elettra S here in Malaysia. 
All in all, as absurdly as this may sound, I think this is a cheap car for what you'd get, especially against its multi-million ringgit rivals. It looks bonkers on the outside, and inside it has one of the absolute best cabins I've seen in the business yet. It is also an accomplished and capable electric SUV. Its range may be closer to 500 rather than the claimed 600, but that should be more than enough for most people, and it also charges back up quicker than most other EVs too. As for performance, the Electra S isn't quite as fast as you would expect. For that, you will need the highest end Electra R, but with options that will cost near to a million ringgit here in Malaysia. As for handling, does it drive like a Lotus? Absolutely not. But this is still more agile, this is still more dynamic than pretty much all its SUV rivals. It still has that little bit of special Lotus touch right there. Pair that together with a decent ride and you've got a very good package overall. This to me is an excellent electric SUV through and through and at this price it really has no rival. It stands alone as the absolute best choice for a hyper electric SUV. So what do you think of this review? What do you think of the Lotus Electra? Do let me know in the comments section below. For now, thank you for watching everyone and stay safe.